tell me about your son. My son, um, at an early age, loves sports, so he's always been into basketball. Um, he's never had an interest for football. He's always been a fairly thin kid, so he's always thought that he was going to get, you know, hurt or something playing football, so he thought that basketball was, you know, definitely the safer route. Um, so he's played softball and baseball and basketball as well, and he's just always had a love for sports. Um, he started to um, recently um, find a love for um, cutting hair. He told me out of nowhere that he wanted to be a barber. And I'm like, a barber? And he's like, yeah. So I'm telling him, you know, of course, as a mother, like, you have to go to the schools and, you know, barber college and, you know, maybe I can get you clippers. And he's like, okay, I'll just, you know, try to cut my brother hair. And I'm like, no, you're not going to do that. But <laughs> Yeah, my son, he's just a ball of fun, and he's a character himself, and he just, you know, just brings joy to everybody that he's around. Of course, he's going to make you, you know, mad and angry about stuff that, you know, he knows better than, and you're just going to be like, why are you doing that? And, you know, but he, he definitely, for the most, most part of it, brighten up everybody's day like I would tell him like no he can't have something and two seconds later I'm giving it to him so <laughs> he has that kind of you know that um just hold over you mm. and, and you both uh, you both are from Stockton you, did you um no Stockton? we're from um San Francisco from the Bay Area um I moved to Stockton with my son in 2012 2013 and we just had been there and um, he's always asked like, you know, why do we move there and stuff like that? But financially just being a single mom and things like that, I had to think about the bigger picture and being able to provide for my son and, you know, somewhere that was inexpensive. So mm -hmm. that's how we resulted to Stockton. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, what, what school did he go to and what grade was he in? Um, he was going to Edison High School, and he was in the 10th grade. I know everyone's in the, was in the middle of this um, distance learning, but did, did he play sports for the school? Um, no, he hadn't got a chance to play sports for the school when he did transfer over um, from his original school before previously, he had um, um, no credits transferred over from this school. So the deal was he was going to, you know, obtain the year and get his credits up and then therefore was able to play. But he was going to be placed on the team and, you know, his coaches had told him, hey, you know, I know you can play base basketball and I know you're really good. So I want you to play for our school. But, you know, they would just told him like, you know, you just got to basically watch for now and you know look at how the drills are going and stuff like that but my son he's just an antsy and anticipated person you know he's like no I gotta play now and if it's like if it's now it's never and you know that type of thing so yeah yeah <laughs> uh take, takes a lot of time it's tough when you have to move around I, I did it a lot of yeah time. he he's How like me he's like me as a kid and I've grown to learn that you have to have a lot of patience and I didn't have that then and he didn't either because my dad, several conversations I had with him as a kid, you have to have patience, be patient. I'm like, what am I being patient about? And now, you know, being an adult, I see that, but you know, he just didn't have it in him. And I was like, yeah, that's how it was. You'll get there one day, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They all, we all do. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's go back to last Friday. Okay. Um, well, and, and take your time with this as much as you need. What, what were you doing and, and just, you know, and, and whatever detail you can describe what, what happened. Okay. So, um, Friday, it's typical day. Um, I work and, um, I just got off of work. Um, I work as a front desk clerk, um, at a hotel. 
And so I get off, you know, at different times and I work, you know, different shifts. So this shift, I was working from 11 to 7 in the morning. Um, I usually, you know, come home and I wake my son up. I woke him up at 9 a.m. That's when the first period starts. After waking him up, he gets on a Zoom call. I was uh, washing my hair and, you know, just getting my mom together and, you know, taking a shower and things like that. And um, he had proceeded to take a shower behind me. And, you know, he's like, Mom, I'm going to get my hair cut. And um, I schedule an appointment, you know. So I said, okay. I take him to go get his hair cut. We might be like five minutes late because we're running on mom time. <laughs> so <laughs> we're about five minutes late. And we get there. And uh, I go cash my check. I go back to the barbershop I'm waiting there you know as always until he's done from the chair you know at this point he's 15 so he makes his own appointments and he goes in and see you know who he wants to cut his hair and you know who he thinks is good and you know stuff like that so that happened and we get he gets in the car after getting a nice haircut and I'm you know checking out the haircut and things and he's talking on the phone to friends and you know showing his haircut and things like that his girlfriend and we uh, go uh, 10 minutes away um, to um, the area where we were. We go park um, there and I pull up in the driveway. It's a whole bunch of um, cars in the driveway. And, you know, usually I'm like, oh my gosh, boy, we're not going to sit in this driveway. And, you know, it's too long. We'll go somewhere else. But this day I'm like, we don't have anything to do. We're just spending time together. I'm in no rush. I just got off of work. So, you know, there's nothing I'm rushing about. We're just, you know, having mom and son Sunday bonding just with each other. Um, I get a text message from a friend. I look down at the text message um, and press send. As soon as I look up, there's... Um, a guy coming towards us and he already has the gun raised in his hand and he's walking fastly and he sh as soon as I look up he's already shooting at this point he's already walking towards us and I, I just you know I've never been in this type of situation before I'm, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs and that's why my voice sounds you know crazy today because I haven't been able to get my voice back because of how much I was screaming that day and um I just was screaming and screaming and trying to get him down and I'm not knowing what's going on and and the the shots are just coming you know at this time they're just coming it's not like the guy suspect shot one time you know this suspect is shooting multiple times and I can't go anywhere I'm stuck you know, I'm stuck. I'm feeling very helpless at this moment. And there was just nothing I could physically do. And I get out the car. I grab my cell phone. I'm not even know where my cell phone was at this time because it was in my hand. And then after the altercation, you know, the in incident was going on, I'm not knowing where it is. So I get out the car and I'm, I'm checking myself and I'm checking my son and... <laughs> I just see blood coming out of his head and a gunshot wound to his head and I see blood come out, out of his eyes and his nose and his mouth and his body and is so I get out the car and I'm screaming and I'm saying, somebody, somebody help me. Like somebody help me, please help me. And I'm just screaming and it's just people are just looking at me like I'm crazy, but nobody's trying to help me. Like nobody was trying to help me and so I'm just screaming and screaming and continuing to scream and trying to check on my son because he's there but I'm not knowing if I've lost him already or if he's still going on so they're like check him and see if he's still breathing check him so I'm, I'm checking him people are telling me it's okay I'm calling 911 I have them on the line they're on their way and I'm checking my son and I feel a pulse so I'm like okay he's still you know he's still here he's still breathing so they're uh, off-duty firefighter he says I'm an off-duty firefighter like open this door open this door now so I unlock my 
my door and he opens it and he grabs my son out the car and he lays him on the ground. I put my jacket under his head to try to have the, the firefighter um, like um, press on his wounds and, you know, sustain his wounds and and at this time I'm still screaming and then I call my mom and I'm just like mom like I'm in the the voice and how I'm screaming this is gonna you know this is gonna mess my mom up for years to come and stuff like that because I'm screaming at the top of my lungs like mom you have to get here like you have and I'm just screaming she can't figure out what I'm saying or what's going on or anything because I can't even get it out physically so I tell her the ambulance, they come, they get my son, they put him into the ambulance. By that, Actually, by that time, the police is there as well. And um, they detain me to the side and, you know, get me away from the crime scene and take him in the ambulance. And I'm like, no, I need to go with him. I need to go with him. You, you guys are sitting me down and trying to have me go sit down. I need to go with him. And they're saying, you know, he's going to be okay. He's going to be fine. We're going to take care of him. You have to physically stay on site because you're a victim, victim and a witness. So I'm not, you know, this is all going on. So I'm hearing them, but I'm not hearing them. Like, what do you mean you guys can't let me go with my son and go with him to the hospital? And what hospital are you guys taking him to? So I get family and I call family, you know, now I'm shaking, but I could, you know, call them out. And so I'm calling them and they're getting to the hospital and everybody's on their way and they're going and I'm still there an hour later after this, you know, after this mm -hmm. has happened. An hour later, I'm still there at the scene. Then they take me in a, a police car and bring me to what I'm thinking is the, the police station. So we're there. I'm in a room talking to them. It's looking like first 48 to me. You know, I've seen this on TV before. So I'm sitting in there. I'm sitting in a room. And I cannot get out this room. I can't just open the door if, if you know, anything. So I'm in a Basically, I'm feeling like I'm in a box. You guys are basically punishing me. Like I've done something wrong. And, mm. and you know, I'm just like, you guys are, you're not telling me anything. You're not letting me know what's going on with my son. You guys are just saying, oh, the, te the detectives will be here to speak with you. Two hours had went past. You guys take my phone from me before I get in the facility and tell me I can't talk to anyone but I'm telling you guys that my mother is hysterically on the phone and she is not capable of driving from San Francisco to Stockton, California, you know, to get to the hospital. I'm trying to make sure my mother's okay, but you know, still within this insanity that's going on. And so, um, they're telling me that he's okay and he's going to be okay. And they'll let me know what's going on with him and everything like that. But you guys aren't telling me anything. Um, I have an iWatch, so when they took my phone, I was able to keep track of the time with my watch. So an hour went past. I get up, I knock on the door. Excuse me, can you tell me what's going on with my son? Can you give me any type of information? Can you tell me anything? He's, no, I can't tell you anything. I can't tell you if he's alive. I can't tell you if he has passed. I can't give you that information. You have to wait on the detectives and anything else. They never never offered me any type of medical attention. Um, right now, I still haven't been to the hospital, but I'm going to make it a point to have myself checked out because my nerves in my right hand, if I take this index finger and rub it across the top of my skin, my nerves feel like there's someone jolting me with like a, a taser. Um, there was glass you, everywhere. I was bleeding. Yeah, were you, and were I you never hit by asked. the glass at all? Were you? Yes, definitely. Mm. Yeah. On my face here, you can't see it because there's just a cut up under here and I have a hat on. But um, mm. yes, and I was telling them like my hand, you know, tell them the situation with my hand. There was blood all down my legs. I had on a thin gray um, um, material. So you can see this blood, you know, and they're not knowing. They're not asking me, hey, do you know if this is your son's blood or if this is your blood? There's blood all on my face like from here, my ear to definitely like the corner of my mouth. 
they're not knowing what that could be or where it's that from. Is there a cut underneath there? Nothing. I'm not being asked mm-hmm. anything. And I'm telling you guys, I need to go to see my son and I need medical attention at this point. And I mm-hmm. kept telling them that me sitting in that room in that box was not good for me mentally. You guys have me here like I'm a caged animal, like I did something wrong and I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with my son and all of this. So two and a half hours later, three hours, um, the detectives show and, you know, ask me questions and stuff like that. And then after asking me questions for 30 minutes, after I'm sitting here detained for two and a half, three hours, you guys let me know that my son has passed. Hmm. Did you feel like a suspect at that point? I felt very much like a suspect. I told them that I feel like I'm in prison, like I'm in jail, like I'm being caged, like there is something that I did wrong physically. And I'm just not understanding why you guys couldn't give me any information or tell me anything or anything. It was like, you you don't want to give me medical attention. You don't want to tell me anything about what's going on with my son or anything. So I'm just shut out at this point. I can't talk to my family. You guys are keeping me away from them and talking to them. You guys turned my cell phone off while I was in custody. I'm not knowing because your cell phone and your watch are connected. So I'm trying to figure out why I can't text my family and talk to them and say, hey, Siri, call, you know, and it's not working because you guys turned my cell phone off without my, my, um, me knowing. Then after you guys told me that my son passed, you dropped me off at the hospital and I'm not able to see my son. Because they wouldn't let you into the hospital. They would not let me into the hospital, sir. When I got to the hospital, I felt like the police department let me out like I was an Uber, like he was an Uber driver, honestly. Like he was an Uber or a Lyft driver. You let me out the car. I got out the car. There was nothing said between us. There was nothing said to my family. You did not escort me to my family or to the hospital. You let me out on the curb. You closed the door and you got back in your vehicle and you went about your business. Uh, And was that, they wouldn't let you into the hospital because of COVID restrictions? Um, no, they didn't even say that, sir. They said they weren't letting me into the hospital because my son needed an autopsy and they weren't letting me in before that. And they weren't going to let me see him, not even see him. I said, I'm not going to physically touch my son, you know, anything. I just want to see him. I don't want that last moment of me seeing him in the car, you know, with that all going on. I want, you know, can I see him? They would not let me see him. This is what the the staff is telling me at general. They're telling Mm -hmm. me that I cannot see my son. So at this point, I'm getting furious and irate now because you guys aren't letting me see here. So I'm telling them like, you guys need to let me see. How are you not going to let me see my son? And he's dead in your hospital. He just died here. I don't know what time he died. I've never talked. Not to this day. I've never talked to anyone that works there at the hospital who's worked on my son. I haven't talked to doctors. I haven't talked to nurses. I haven't talked to paramedics. I haven't talked to anyone. Anyone about any complications that may have came into contact with when you guys took my son. I haven't talked to anyone. You guys haven't relayed any message. I don't know what time my son has passed. I don't know the time. Hmm. Not only to have dealt with the trauma, but then the experience both with the police department and then not being allowed in the hospital. What was that like for you? It was horrible. Horrible. It was worse than horrible. It it, it was just, I can't even describe on, on how I felt. It was so wrong. I felt like it was very wrong. It was, it's like, it's no words to describe it. It was I can't even describe how I felt at that time. I just felt belittled. I felt like this is my son. You guys are keeping him away from me. I'm not knowing any information. I can't even know a time of death. And I'm his mother. You guys are telling me you can't release any information to my family. 
before you release it to me, but you guys aren't even releasing me this information. I'm being kept from this information. Hmm. And he was taken to General Hospital? That, yes. That's San Joaquin County? Yes. Okay. And, um, uh, and, and back to what happened at the, the Burger King, um, do you have any idea why somebody would do something like this? No, my son, everyone that knows him knows he, he's quiet, kept um, at home. He stays in his room. He plays video games. He's not a, a, a bothersome child. You know, he's not um, this child where he's just, you know, doing this and that and this and that. He's a consistent person where you would say, oh, Makai's in the room. Or, oh, Makai's playing basketball. Or, Makai's on the game. You know, and these are things that he's doing if you go look for him and find him. You know, you know what he's doing. He's been very predictable. So, it's just like, I don't know why this person felt the need to take my son's life that day. I don't know why they they came in, you know, did whatever they did and shot. And I'm not understanding any of this. I can't wrap my head around it. I don't know anyone that would want to hurt me or my son so this is this is very tough for me and and trying to you know i'm not gonna wrap my head around it but i you know I, it's still i can't um wh what do you hope to happen next i want this person found I need this person found. I want him in police custody. I need this person off the streets. And I feel like everyone else, you know, feels that way also because he doesn't care. Whoever this person is, he doesn't care about taking someone's life and uh, taking a child's life in front of his mother. And you, you don't care at this point, you know? You don't care at this point. You, you, this person will probably shoot at the police and all this other type of stuff. You know, you, you shot at me and my son in the car and, and my son is no longer here. So it's, it's, we don't know what you're capable of. Nobody does. How, how are you doing? Honestly, I'm... I'm numb, very numb, very numb. Uh, you know, I have a younger son and I know I need to be there for him and, you know, family and, you know, but I'm numb. I'm just trying not to let myself, you know, get to a place where I'm going to be taken over by this, tr you know, tragic situation because, you know, I know people who's lost, you know, loved ones that have been close to them. And I've lost my sister at 21, uh, I'm sorry, 22 when she was 21 to violent, senseless murder. Hmm. She didn't do anything to nobody, you know, her and her boyfriend, they're walking and someone just randomly shoots them both. So my family, we's, we've been in this situation before and it's just very, very hard. Definitely, you know, this second time around, definitely. Yes. Wow, I'm uh, so sorry for all of that, um, and I and I hope that the police department can get some answers to you soon and and find out who did this and get them off. I would the hope, I would hope so because right now the way I'm feeling is that my son is just another senseless killing. You got you feel that that's how I feel that the police are treating it. I'm not feeling like. There's any comp there was no compassion. I didn't feel any any compassion from the Stockton Police Department, nor did I feel any compassion from the hospital. I felt no compassion. Everyone that I came into contact was cold after this happening to me. And these are pe people that are saying, I'm sorry for your loss and you know, you're okay and but 
I'm looking at these people in their eyes. I'm giving them that attention as, as they're saying this to me. And I'm not feeling that same way. I'm not feeling the words that are coming out of their mouth that I'm not feeling that at all. That's not getting to me. Like it's, it's just like your mouth is just saying words because there was no feeling behind it. None. Mm -hmm.